In our passage today, we're going to be studying verse 21 through 34, and we know from a couple weeks ago that Jesus and his disciples are still along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and this is where Jesus makes his teaching ministry a lot more prevalent. He's not just proclaiming the kingdom of God, but he begins to teach and unfold the ways of the kingdom. And two weeks ago, we brought up a parable, and you could call this parable the parable of the seed, the sower, and the soils. We focused on the soils, and Jesus wanted to share and show a point. And this was about how the four soils represented four different kinds of hearts. And the parable, the point of it at least, was that if your heart is good soil, meaning if it's open, if it's receptive, if it's humble, if it's desiring of God to know what Jesus is truly saying, then your life will be fruitful in the kingdom of God, if your heart, if your heart is good soil. And so it was all about the heart. And we noted that Jesus began to teach in parables. And I talked about how there were somewhere around 46 parables in Jesus's teaching ministry. And he said about the parable of the soils that this one, it wasn't that it was the most important, it's that it was the key to unlock all of the other teaching that he would give. And one of the reasons that Jesus taught in parables was that he wanted to draw the seeker in to ask the question for further instruction, but he also was distancing the superficial. It was not his desire to distance anyone. He wanted everyone to know. He wanted everyone to inquire. He wanted everyone to ask what it is that he was talking about. He wanted them to walk in the truth, but he also knew that there were crowds out there and everyone came for different reasons. And so his desire in his teaching certainly was to draw the seeker and to convert people to devoted disciples because he knew that if you do not listen to my words, And if you do not follow what I'm saying, you will not be here for very long. He knew that. And so it was in his heart to not only teach this, but to to share it continually throughout his ministry. Today, we're going to talk about a few more parables, three of them. And we're talking about the parable of the lamp, the parable of the growing seed, and the parable of the mustard seed. These are the three parables, and they're very connected to what we've already shared in our previous message. So let me go ahead and read verse 21 all the way to the end of the chapter. Uh, Here's what the Bible says. And Jesus was saying to them, a lamp is not brought to be put under a basket, is it? Or under a bed? Is it not brought to be put on a lampstand? For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been secret, but that it would come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. I've already told you, Jesus says that about eight times. And if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. This is important. I want everyone to hear, but you need to press in. And he was saying to them, take care of what you listen to. By your standard of measure will be measured to you. And more will be given you besides. For whoever has to him, more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. And he was saying, The kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil and he goes to bed at night and he gets up by day and the seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself does not know. The soil produces crop by itself, first the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And he said, how shall we picture the kingdom of God? Or by what parable shall we present it? It's like a mustard seed which when sown upon the soil, though it is smaller than all the seeds that are upon the soil, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large branches so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. With many such parables, he was speaking the word to them so far as they were able to hear it. And he did not speak to them without a parable. Now here's the last verse and and underline this at least in your mind. But he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. This is the word of the Lord. He was explaining everything to his own disciples. When he taught in parables, it was not to give a cryptic code. He wanted people to understand, but he knew that he needed to somehow draw them in, and he did so by the way that he taught. In Mark chapter 4, his teaching is focused completely on the kingdom of God, and what he's doing is he's giving a blueprint for how the kingdom is going to unfold to the end of the age. Now, he's not fully explaining that, but what he is doing is giving enough so that later on he can continue to add and build upon his teaching. 
And if I were to summarize chapter four, I would say it like this, and this is what I would think Jesus would be teaching. I am the king, Jesus. I am preaching the good news of my kingdom. And if your heart is open, you'll, you'll receive, you'll bear fruit, and you'll become part of the expansion which will be established by me, but through you. And this is a really important piece. The kingdom is established by the king, but in these parables, he's trying to teach them, I want it to further in the earth through you. You get to become part of what I'm doing. Now, this is an interesting point because the backdrop of Jesus' teaching in the Jewish community would have been this. They thought that the Messiah, when he comes, would reveal himself as in sort of a military political power. I mean, he would rise up and he would have whoever along, along his side and he would have the kind of might and the kind of strength and the kind of power to overthrow all other kingdoms, all other powers. And he would be able to do that as he would raise up Israel along his side. This is what the Jewish community believed. They did not understand a first and a second coming in the in-between time. They did not know how the kingdom would grow. They did not know how the gospel would be spread. They didn't think of, of the Messiah as a suffering servant and then a conquering king. They didn't have that paradigm. They only had a coming of Jesus or a coming of a Messiah, not two coming, two, a first and a second coming. They didn't know that. And so the backdrop of this teaching and understanding Jesus unfolding his kingdom and the way that it would expand is very important because it would have been a massive shift within the Jewish community. And so this blueprint was essential and it was required for them to grasp. And he's saying to them, you have to have a receptive heart because what I'm teaching is going to confront what you already think is going to happen. This is why you have to have an even more receptive heart than just being open to me. You have to be willing to change your thinking. You have to be willing to change your mind, all right? This is really a vital piece of Jesus' teaching. And what I wanna do is I wanna separate the three parables and I wanna use them as basically three exhortations today. I think these are the things that he is teaching through each one of them and they build on each other, which usually is what Jesus does. When he teaches parables in a row, they have a sequential order and they're very connected. And so the first one is this, I believe that he's teaching us to shine the light boldly. Shine the light boldly. And here's what verse 21 says. And Jesus was saying to them, a lamp is not brought to be put under a basket, is it? Or under a bed? Is it not brought to be put on the lampstand? For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been secret, but that it would come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he was saying to them, take care what you listen to by your standard of measure, it'll be measured to you and more will be given you besides. But whoever has to him, more shall be given and whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away. Now, I love the straightforwardness of Jesus. I just do. I, I love how <laughs> he shoots it straight. He says, a lamp is not meant to be put under a basket, is it? I just want to know if there was any person in the audience that said, yes, it is. I mean, I want to know that guy, you know. Don't be that one today, though. Don't. If I bring up a point, it's rhetorical. Don't mess me up, all right? But in their culture, you may not, I mean, when we think of lamps, we think of whatever we're going to see at Costco tomorrow or to, today. You're probably going to go to Costco after the service or Fred Meyers or Walmart or whatever. I don't know whatever your thing is. But we think of lamps, like large lamps and LED lights. We don't know what they had in their culture. In their culture, they used these small clay lamps. When Jesus was talking about a lamp, he was talking about something like this. It could have been a little larger than this, but this is basically a replica of an ancient lamp. And what you have is a little wick. And Pastor Jared talked about the the, the wise and the foolish virgins uh, last week. And this is where you would put the oil. And if you didn't have any extra oil, this can only carry a few ounces. And so at some point it's gonna run out. You have to have a flask where you can put more oil in it. So the foolish virgins were the ones that didn't have enough oil when it ran out. But these are little lamps. And no, you can't have mine. You can go on Amazon for $13 and get one of these. And I'm not even saying it's a good product. So I did not give it a review yet. I'm just saying, usually I buy, this is how lame I can be sometimes. Sorry, children, uh, if there's any in here. I, I buy this stuff as a sermon illustration and it never arrives on time. So you can't imagine how excited I was to actually have those sync today. Great, really great. But you have this lamp. And so what you would do is, is in ancient culture, 
is especially on the Sabbath because you couldn't make a fire on the Sabbath. And so this is what they would use. They would, just, they would have to have the oil already in it and they would light the wick. And so Jesus is saying, you wouldn't take your lamp and put it under a bed, would you? And they were all, no. And you wouldn't take this and you wouldn't put a basket over it, would you? And they were like, no, that's not the point. And he's like, right, what you would do is you guys take your lamp, your light, and you put it on a lampstand. Now, a lampstand would have been a shelf protruding out of, of a house. You know, if somebody, if you were just sort of common middle or lower class, you just have a shelf. But if you live the fancy life, you would have a lampstand. Remember when Jesus in Revelation talks about the lampstands? Sometimes we think of the menorah, but that's not necessarily what he meant. There were lampstands that these little lamps would, would be on, and he talked about taking away their lampstand. Well, then the, the light of Christ wouldn't have a place to shine from, right? So they wouldn't have that influence that Jesus had given to them to represent him as the Messiah and to preach his gospel. But Jesus is asking a rhetorical question, and he's saying, you would not take your lamp or your light and hide it, would you? And what he's trying to say is that there is this this temptation for people to hide the light. There is a temptation, and before he ever gives them the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations or preach the gospel, which is also the light of the world, Jesus is the light, but his words are an extension of who he is. So his words are the light. This is the light of Christ, the light of the glory of the gospel. And he's saying to them that there will be a temptation for you to hide your light and sing to yourself, this little light of mine, I'm not going to let it shine. <laughs> this, he's saying this little, let it shine. You don't understand. He's like, the gospel of the kingdom was not meant to be secret. It was meant to be shared with everyone. And this is what he's after. He's saying what I am and what I'm saying and what I'm giving to you because the kingdom's going to unfold through you. He's going to go and his words are going to be given to his disciples. And that means the kingdom is going to expand through the people that carry the light. And he's teaching them in advance, shine the light boldly. Don't be ashamed. Don't, don't be afraid. You don't have to force light onto people. You just have to shine it. You just have to shine it. You just have to live it. Don't hide it. Don't ever hide it. And then he makes this comment that I think can get really confusing in verse 24, he says this, and it's very connected, but it doesn't look like it. He says, take care of what you listen to. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you and more will be given you besides. For whoever has to him more shall be given. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away. What is he talking about? He's saying the gospel of the kingdom is the light that illuminates the path to God and to the Messiah who is Jesus Christ. And he's saying that if you take what I have given to you, you will receive more. If you share what I give, you will have more illumination, more revelation. You will be able to shine brighter and to show more of the gospel of Jesus. In other words, if you hide your light, you will not get more, but what you have will be taken from you. If you hide what I give to you, you will watch, watch this. You will not have, you will not be what I've called you to be. There will be a holy frustration in any person that names the name of Christ, but does not share or shine what he has given. And he's saying, but if you do shine the light, watch, I'm going to give you more. The light is going to shine brighter and it will expand even more through your life. Now, this concept of light is well used throughout the scripture, and I just want to share a few references with you. First of all, in John chapter 8, John 9, John 1, a lot of others, Jesus is, he speaks of himself and he says, I am the light of the world. And in other places, he also means to say, my gospel, my word is the light of the world. It also says in Matthew 5.14, Jesus speaking to his disciples, he says, let your light so shine among men that they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And can I tell you today that Jesus is not just saying do good works. Now you have to watch this. He's not just saying do good works. Be a nice person so that people think you're a nice person. He's not saying that. If you show your light, if you let your light so shine among men that they see what you do, how will they glorify your Father in heaven if they do not know that you believe in a Father in heaven? See, what he's talking about is that we're not ashamed. He's not saying go and be brash, go and beat it into people. He's saying you have to come out of the shadows and into the light. And when you do that, no matter how many people that are in your sphere of influence, if they know you're a Christian, they see the good deeds that you do and they will 
have no choice but to glorify your Father in heaven. But they've got to know that you're a person that follows Jesus. You're not, you know, just somebody that wants to do nice things. And, and, and I'm not saying don't do nice things, but it isn't for the glory of self. Because if people just think that we do good because we're good people, then it's going to be for the glory of self. And so when he's talking about shining the light, the light is not us. The light is not our good deeds. The light is Christ. The light is the glory and the gospel of Jesus. And you got to get out of your mind whatever picture of an evangelist you have. I mean, we often just sort of, honestly, I think we sort of cower down because we think an evangelist or evangelism or sharing and showing the gospel of Jesus has a lot to do with people we are not like. But Jesus is calling every person and whoever they are to shine the light and to do so boldly. And did you know that when you sign up to be a Christian, that he gives you more than you can handle and it's always enough to share? And so when we say yes to Jesus, there's a corresponding commitment to take whatever he gives us and give it away to others. I'll prove it to you. Uh, You don't seem convinced. (laughs) When you come to Christ, you have to what? You have to be forgiven of your sin. Jesus died in our place and he died for the forgiveness of our sin. So you receive forgiveness. What does Jesus call you to do? To forgive others. Now we, Ryan, Pastor Ryan read a passage out of Romans chapter five last night And it talks about how the love of God is poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. We know that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. When you give your life to Jesus, it's like you're receiving that love. See, love given is not love received. But when you come to Christ, you're receiving the love of God in Christ Jesus. And then what does Jesus tell us to do? To love God and to? The thing that you receive is the very thing that you give. So when you are given the gospel, when you receive the gospel of Jesus, he is saying, do not hide what you have been given. I have given you enough to share. And every Christian, me, you, and everyone else will always be frustrated if we do not give away what he has so lavished upon our life. One of the reasons why we get frustrated simply is this, is that we do not shine this little light of mine. Now, you're welcome, married people. You're going to wake up tonight singing that just out of the blue. This is a lot of mine. And somebody might go, poof. <laughs> I apologize. The Bible says in John chapter 3, the part that we don't read, verse 19, it says that people live in darkness and love darkness, which is why they do not come to the light. That the light came into the world And there were some people that did not come to the light because their deeds were evil and they were content living in them. We also know that the devil will oppose the light of Christ, 2 Corinthians 4.4. It's very clear that the devil blinds the minds of the unbelievers so much so that they cannot see the light and the glory of of the gospel. Isn't that true in our culture today? Trying to cast a shadow on everything that is Jesus. Look at all the Christians that have failed. I mean, this is literally the media consumption. Every bad deed that is ever done by anybody that names the name of Christ is absolutely the front and center in every newspaper. Isn't that true? I mean, the last thing I was reading was Hillsong scandal and it was like Carl this and whoever that and it was like, this is a horrible church. Yeah, let's, this is, there is an agenda and I'm not advocating for them at all, but show a shadow on everything bad that anybody Christian or church does. Friends, I want to tell you, all over the world, people that name the name of Jesus are giving their life away, giving their finances away, doing good because they love Jesus. But you're not going to see that in the media. So don't spend too much time reading those headlines because people all over the world and all over our church are doing a whole lot of good. They are shining the light brightly. So I don't believe everything the world is selling because I know that God is doing so much more, even through, even through us. But don't you know, Jesus is speaking to this thing. You are going to be tempted to hide your light. You're going to be tempted. You're going to be tempted by all kinds of people in all kinds of places. But don't do that. Shine it boldly. The second parable and the second exhortation is sow the seed generously. Here it says in verse 26, and he was saying, another parable, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. And he goes to bed at night and he gets up by day and the seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Now this is not complicated. The farmer 
is Jesus, but Jesus is preparing his disciples to be farmers. He's telling them, you're going to sow the seed. And that actually goes for us as modern day disciples as well. We are farmers in, in this parable. And the seed is the word of God, or more specifically, the gospel of the kingdom of God. And the harvest is twofold. The harvest is that every time we sow the word of God and every time we, we generously share the word of God with other people, the gospel of Jesus, that that seed will bear fruit in one way or another. But we know that that harvest can be both initially, but Jesus is also making a reference to the end of the age. He's talking about that we sow, we sow, we sow, but ultimately this consummation of his kingdom is that the king returns back to this world and sets up and establishes, consummates his kingdom and it will be left to, to no other. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. The Bible's quite clear. So no matter what any government does, no matter, matter what any war is pending, there is a kingdom that has been established, is expanding and will be consummated and it doesn't matter what the kingdoms of the world do because Jesus is going to have it all. He's going to have it all. That's the harvest of the end of the age, but he's giving his disciples an emphasis. And that emphasis is now on the seed. Now, last night I was preaching this message because if you didn't know, we have a 5 p.m. Saturday night service and feel free to come or come to the 9 a.m. It doesn't matter to me. Anyways, somebody uh, and I'll leave her name out, but as I was preaching, she thought he needed another illustration. So this just magically showed up on my chair at the end of the message. This is mustard seed. This is definitely not ancient mustard seed, but you can see, I don't know if this is gonna be a mess. Uh, we'll just throw this around in worship. I don't know uh, what will happen. But listen, pray for me, guys. Um, this seed is small. This is like, Jesus is emphasizing something, right? I'm just gonna toss one at Jared. There you go, buddy. All right. <laughs> They're just, they're, just fly, they're just flying. Just sow it. I don't know. Yeah, j see, I told you, the power in the seed. But <laughs> Jesus is emphasizing something very powerful here. He's saying there is more power in the seed than you realize. You don't have to produce anything. What you have to do is just sow the seed. And if you know that this seed carries power, th think about this. If you know this seed has so much power in it, why in the world do we just not sow it as much as we can? And he's trying to say something that you can't produce, you can't manufacture, you can't make happen. That is not yours to do. The farmer, look, look what the farmer does. The farmer sows the seed and then what does he do? That guy goes to sleep. What does the farmer know that we don't know? The farmer knows the power is in the seed. And listen, I don't go to sleep when I'm worrying about something. How many of you probably were worrying about something last night? Don't raise your hand, but you didn't sleep very well. You're worried about something. And maybe you should have been, but I'm just saying, when you're worried, when you're in anxiety, when you're in fear and you don't know what's gonna happen, you sow the seed and you're like, oh, what do I gotta do? How do I gotta water it? Did I put it in the right place? And Jesus is saying, sow the seed. And here's what the farmer knows. He goes to sleep. The farmer goes to, goes to sleep because he knows something that we need to be reminded of is that the seed has power. It has more power than we often realize. And he wants them to get that. Can I tell you today that the words of Jesus are powerful? Our life is not perfect like his life, but the seed is powerful. And if we just sow the seed, if we just talk about Jesus and people might look annoyed and they might reject us, but who cares? Because friends, we know something they don't know. There's power in that seed. I'm just gonna be walking in Home Depot today with seeds in my pocket. Just do that. Thank you, Lord. Just go for it. It's a metaphoric thing. You know, it, it helps you. All right, so I'm gonna put the cap on here real quick or I'm gonna get crazy. I get crazy. Yeah, lucky it's not a water sermon, Ryan. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Water, the Holy Spirit, rivers of living water. I might have to bring out a hose, you know, <laughs> or super soaker, something like that. Knowing me, I'd probably shoot myself. I mean, it just, uh, I, it, all right. Uh, you know, I was thinking about this, sowing the seed generously, and uh, uh, don't get offended. Amen. Don't get offended. Amen. Amen. All right. Just, it's not going to be that bad. But uh, because some of you, some of you are, you have a small business, okay? And I'm all for free enterprise, all right? But I've had many sit downs with people in the free enterprise world, wh whether it's Amway or uh, different companies like that, okay? So anyways, if, if you're into that, I'm not against it. I'm just, I, I'm not buying. That's all I'm saying. So, but 
some of my friends, and I have a really good friend, is so into essential oils that like she thinks, I'm not, listen, my wife uses essential oils, so don't get offended because some of you sell it, all right? I'm, I'm risking here. Some people are so into essential oils, like your leg could break and they're like, just apply this lav lavender on here and your leg just, it'll just snap back into place. You'll be fine. Just snap. There it is. Just I was, at my friend, I was at my friend's house. I went to speak at a church, and I was, this was a while ago, and, and um, I have a reaction. I'm, I have an allergic reaction to certain essential oils. I did not know this because I don't use them uh, for, for, for personal reasons, but I was in my friend's house, and they have a guest bedroom, and I went to sleep, and she was talking to me about essential oils, and I was like, hey, that's really great. I hope you know, it works out for you, whatever. And then I went to bed and I didn't know what a diffuser was. It's, it's, uh, I grew up with a dehumidifier because I had a deviated septum and they look like something that a Star Wars character would wear on their head. You know, those old dehumidifiers? And it, it's like, ah. I was so drawn to Star Wars as a kid because I had this thing in my room. And I'm like, mom, dad, is this thing really supposed to work? You know, I don't, you just, you just wake up drenched, you know, it wasn't a, it's traumatic. It is, it's so, there was this little thing on the shelf and it was sending out this, uh, whatever this, you guys know what it is. It was a diffuser, but I literally was choked up all night. I couldn't sleep at all. I was like, <laughs> and, and I woke up, I went down to the breakfast table and she was like, how did you sleep? I said, yeah, I don't really know. And, and then I got up in the morning, I couldn't sleep and I just feel all choked up. And, and there was this thing in the room and it was sending this mist. And she goes, oh yeah, that's my uh, diffuser. I forgot to take that out. I go, but it was on like all night. And I didn't know what it was that it was spraying this stuff at me. And I think she just walked in the room and just gave me a, a couple of those at the, she really believes in it, you know? And so I was, get them in, Lord, get them in. So I'm sitting at the breakfast table. This is the truth. I'm sitting at the breakfast table. As I'm sharing this, I'm like, and I'm still really like choked up right now. And I look over to my left and there's another diffuser sending this stuff into my face. <laughs> this is exactly how it is. You might be watching. You know who you are. It's true. And so, but here's the thing. That's just a funny story that has no significance on the message at all. But what does is that some people believe in products more than we believe in the gospel. And I wish, I really do. And this morning when we pray, let's pray this. If there is so much power in the seed, let's pray that God would give us a heart to sow as generously as possible because what we're carrying is more powerful than any product on the planet. And I'm not against these things, but I think if we were as passionate about the gospel as some people are about these types of businesses, I think that we would make a bigger dent in the kingdom of hell and we would see heaven populated way more than we ever have. And this is what I believe today. Jesus is saying, sow the seed generously. We're excited about it. Even when people on the outside, they're like, don't be talking to me about Jesus and, and don't be showing your light and don't be talking about how much you love him. Friend, I'm, we're going to talk about it. And here's what we know as the world gets darker, the light is, is more needed and it's necessary. Friends, I want to tell you something today. You're a light bringer and you're a seed sower. And it looks to me like we've got barren lands. It looks to me like we've got a lot of darkness. So this is job security for Christians today. And so you can get mad about the darkness and you can get mad about the barren fields or you can realize this little light of mine and I'm gonna sow the seed no matter what you're asking for or what you say. You've got job security, friends. I'm not mad about what's going on because I got too much seed in my hands, you know? Here's what I'm walking around like. <laughs> this is a time to get excited. You've got something, you've got a solution, come on now. And people aren't just gonna beg you for it, but they still need it. How many of you, before you met Jesus Christ, you weren't asking for the light and you didn't know that you needed the seed, but aren't you thankful that somebody was sowing the seed and somebody was showing the light? Aren't you thankful that even when you weren't asking for it, somebody was still giving it? Isn't that right today? So this is what we need, and we need to remember that we're a part of God's solution in the world. And I wanna encourage you today that even if you've been sowing and you don't see something happening, God is still at work. Maybe you've been sowing the word of God into your children, into your workplace, and you feel rejected, you feel like people aren't listening, you feel like nobody has, uh, has been doing anything with what you've been saying. I wanna tell you something, the seed is more powerful. It's more powerful than what you're seeing right now. Either what Jesus said is true or it's not. He said the farmer knows that when he goes to sleep, he's gonna wake up and whenever the crop permits, it's gonna happen. The harvest is gonna come. And I, I believe that means in our families and that means in our workplaces and that means in our neighborhood and that means in federal way and that means in this nation and the nations of the earth. If we keep sowing, we're gonna see things start growing. That's just, that rhymes and I feel right about that. I just do. <laughs> so if you see a need, sow a seed. 
All right, Craig. All right, Craig. Come on now. How weird would it be to just walk around with seeds in your pocket? You just picture that. You're just walking around in barren fields with just seeds in your pocket. How weird would it be to be around people that can't see and have, have a lamp? It'd just be strange. Jesus is using these parables to help us, and I, I'm so thankful that he did. And the last one is this. It's very simple. Expect the growth abundantly. Verse 26 in the final parable, he said, how shall we picture the kingdom of God? As if you guys already don't get it. By what parable shall we present? It's like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the soil, though it is the smaller of the seeds that are upon the soil, yet when it is sown, it grows up, it becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large branches so the birds of the air can nest under its shade. And he's talking about the nations of the earth. In this particular parable, he's talking about that the kingdom is sown and it's smaller than anything else. But friends, I want you to know it's going to get huge. This is what he's talking about. He's like, it looks small right now, but it's going to get massive. And that's what a mustard seed would do. A mustard, a mustard plant would get like 12 to 15 feet large. And it was as large in its width as it, as it was in its height. And he's saying birds of the air. He's talking about the nations of the earth. That's in Revelation. The nations of the earth will find their place in, in this large thing that God is doing. He wanted them to be encouraged. He's saying, look, this is how the kingdom is going to expand. You thought that I was going to show up as the Messiah and just take over. But I want to tell you something. I'm pulling you into this plan. I'm going to give my life. I'm going to rise from the dead. I'm going to ascend to the Father. And everything I'm teaching you, I'm putting it into your care. And it's like light and it's like seeds. And as you shine it and as you show it, you can expect that I am going to do a great and mighty work. And it might look small now, but it's going to grow and expand. And you get to be a part of it. You get to be a part of it. So you have to expect. You have to have faith. And that's what God wanted to, wants to renew in us, to have faith that where it looks small and where it looks like Christianity might be diminishing, he's saying this kingdom is not left for another people. This kingdom is an expansive kingdom. This power is like no other, no other power. This message is like no other message. What you're a part of is the greatest thing in the world because it's under King Jesus. Now, Jesus was saying that to 12 and he lost one. Now there's 11. Church history would tell us after Jesus rose from the dead, there was at least 120 believers. Some say there were over 500. We know there were 120 at the day of Pentecost. And guess what happened on the day of Pentecost? This is just 50 days after Jesus had risen from the dead. 50 days after, there's 3,000 Christians. We went from 12 to 11 to 120 to 500 and 3,000 and what you know about 62 AD, some people say there were 10,000. Some people say at the end of the book of Acts, there were 100,000 believers. We're talking just 30, 40, 50 years later. And when you follow church history, they say at 200 AD, there was at least 150,000. I want you to see expansion. I want you to see expansion. At least 150,000. And by 350 AD, it's incalculable. They have no clue how many believers there were. Some people say there was 3 million. Some say there was 17 million. We don't know. I mean, it's exponential. Christianity, the gospel went viral through people who just dared to believe that this little thing, these words about a king who came and gave his life for the forgiveness of sins and that he's going to return and all those who believe in him will have eternal life in his name. They're just words, but these words have power. These words have power unto eternal life. Paul said in, in Romans chapter one and verse 16, he said, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It's the power of God. These words have power. And we see as we look today in the world in 2010, they estimated 2 billion Christians. That's one third of the planet. I think that's high. Some people ask the question, how many of those really believe in Jesus? I don't know. But I want to say something to you about America. In 2010, uh, they had a poll of how many people were professing Christians in 2021. And the statistics that I read show at least 18 to 20 percent decline in the United States of America for, in just 11 years. And I want to tell you something that shouldn't discourage any of us unless we do not believe that the seed will grow or the light will shine. And that's what I think happens to a lot of us. And let's just be honest today. We look at the light and we look at the seed and it looks like nothing compared to what's happening in the world. But I want to encourage you today that if Jesus breathes on it, it's more powerful than anything. 
It's more powerful than anything. And so what we're fighting for today as Christians is to believe that what we have is more powerful than anything else that's out there. Do you believe that today? But could you use a renewal of faith? Could you use a renewal of faith today? Because listen, I'll tell you what, I could. We live in the Pacific Northwest and we're known for all kinds of things. We're known for mountains and clean air and rain, God help us, and a lack of a basketball team and oceans and lakes and all kinds of beautiful scenery. We're known for all this wonderful natural stuff, but spiritually we are not known for vibrant churches and sold out disciples. We are not known for passionate young people filled with the Holy Spirit, willing to give their all to Jesus. We're not known for that, but we can be but we can be. And so my faith is being renewed in the sense that in this generation and in this generation that is unfolding, no matter what I see, God, because of what he's given, can cause us to increase for the glory of King Jesus. I believe because that's his will. It's not my will. It's not a cute vision for our church that goes up on the walls. It is his desire that the nations of the earth come to know Jesus Christ. That is his desire. That is his will. And if it's his, then what we are doing is partnering with what God is doing. That's all that we are doing today. And so this message and this ministry has been entrusted into our care. What do you want to do with it? What do you want to do with it? We come together on the weekends. Let's get fired up and let's get sent out and sow the seed and shine the light. Are you hiding your light? Come out of the shadows. Are you keeping the seed in your pocket? Start throwing it. Start giving it away. And Jesus says this, The one that gives away, more will be given. But the one that does nothing with what they have, even what they have will be taken away. God help us to not be like that. Amen. Without any guilt in the room, without any shame of the past, let's ask him for a holy expectation and faith for the future. That's all that matters today. The past is gone. What do you want to do with what God's given? Would you pray with me today? Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for the seed and for the light. And we ask you, Lord, today that you would, that you would renew our faith, that we who live in the Pacific Northwest are not afraid of the darkness. We are not afraid of barren lands. We are expectant and we believe that you are at work even if we don't see it. We're expectant and we believe that it's not up to our excitement. It's not up for what we do per se, but we're just supposed to be faithful with what you've given. And we believe that, Lord, if we sow and if we shine, that you're going to do a great and mighty work. And we prophesy that into the ground of the Pacific Northwest. We prophesy that into our families, into our own hearts and homes. We ask you to do it. Do it again, Lord. The revivals that we've seen in the past, do it again, Lord. Find fertile soil in us. Thank you, Lord, for sowing seed abundantly inside of us. And may we be faithful, Lord, with what you give. We're asking that you would help us to do our part that we would be faithful. As you would stand, I want to close by sharing with you a prophetic thought. In just a moment here, our pastors are going to come forward to pray. Our prayer leaders can come forward too at this time if you guys want to come up front. I had a vision earlier in pre-service prayer. You can join us if you'd like. And Sunday morning, we have pre-service prayer at 8.15. That's for anybody. We also have pre-service prayer before our Ignite gathering at 6.15 before our 7 p.m. Wednesday night service. We also have pre-service prayer before our 5 p.m. service because we believe that God moves as we pray, that it's his work. All we're doing is asking, just like we sow the seed. It's his seed and it's the power that he accomplishes as we sow. As we pray, God will do great things. We've watched God answer our prayers. And so we're getting more specific in our prayers. We're praying specific prayers. And as we prayed this morning, we have to believe that God's gonna do some of the things that we prayed for. We have to believe that. It's just simple faith. And I had this vision, I had this picture, and there were some that would be either watching online or would be here in the room today. And you had all these weapons and it represented anger. It represented fear. When we're afraid, we wanna protect. That's what we wanna do. It represented anger. And there were these weapons and you were flailing with these weapons in this vision. And I saw people walk up with their natural weapons and just lay them on the altar. It was a faith move toward God. You just laid them on the altar because you were fighting against people rather than fighting for people. And when you laid your weapons down, God by his spirit revived you to believe that just as he brought you back to life, so he is bringing people in our world back to life. 
and that we've got to stop fighting against people and we've got to stop, start fighting for them because greater is he who is in us than anything else that is in the world. He wants to change the way that we think, but we've got to lay down the weapons at the altar. He is not weaponizing us. He is gospel centralizing us. He is helping us to get centered on the glorious gospel. Come on, that changed your life. Did it change your life? He changed our lives. The words of Jesus are more powerful, friends. So we lay down our weapons today. And I also had this picture, and I would say it to you like this. Of, um, we saw this on Wednesday, and I prophesy this over our church. No, no matter who, it, who it's referencing, we, don't, we do not know. But I had this picture of caskets, and they were just laid out and and there were people that were still alive living. They were in the caskets and they were nailed shut. And I was thinking in my mind, like, how is this happening? Like, people are still alive. They're meant to be living. They're not meant to go, to go to sleep or die. This is too early. And it was a spiritual metaphor. And I saw as we begin to cry out for the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me just tell you, as I saw this vision in Wednesday night prayer, everybody started praying for the power of the Holy Spirit to come. Isn't that just like the Lord? We started to cry out for the power of God's spirit to come. And friends, it did. His power began to come upon us as we were praying and we started praying bold prayers. And the Lord was speaking in my heart saying, listen, there are some that are living dead. And I watched as the power of the spirit hit the caskets and they all opened up and people got up out of the caskets and they were alive. And I wanna prophesy over you today that if you feel like you're spiritually dead or you know you have been living that dead Christian life, the Holy Spirit is the one that makes you alive. And I say to you today by the Holy Spirit that you are alive in Jesus Christ. You are alive in the name of Jesus. And friends, if you're here today and you're feeling that, I'm telling you the power of the Holy Spirit can hit you you, touch you, fill you, and make you alive in Jesus again. If you need that, if you need to be alive in Jesus and you're saying, I need to be woken up, I need to be shaken up, I need to live again, you might be alive, but maybe you're not living and it's time that we ask him to fill us with his power and to fill us with his life so that we can bring the name of Jesus glory. If you need that today, go ahead and reach toward it. Father, we thank you. We ask you to baptize us in the power of the Spirit. We thank you that it is by your power that we can represent Jesus. It is not our courage that we muster. It is not the strength that we personally have. It is by your power. It is by your spirit. And we thank you today that you're making us alive. And we prophesy that over every heart and home in this place, that Northwest Church is a church that is alive. We are a church that is alive. Let the neighborhood know, let the nation know that we are a church that is alive and that what you give us to do, we shall do. We are not living just to survive. We are here to thrive and bring the, bring the glory to Jesus. And I pray today that, Lord, we would experience that awakening. And I say to you today, friends, church, I say to you that you're gonna, some of you are gonna experience an awakening. Don't be surprised if you have to pull your car over on the side of the road to begin to pray in the spirit. Don't be surprised if you wake up in the morning and God gave you, gave you a heavenly dream. Don't be surprised if you're reading the Bible and it once was boring and it becomes alive. Don't be surprised if all of a sudden the lamp, the light of your prayer life begins to shine. Don't be surprised if God starts to wake you up in ways that you weren't even asking for. Don't be surprised because God's gonna do a work inside of us. Just as we sow seed in the lives of others, he's sowing seed in us today. So Father, we ask for you to do that work in us and we thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen.